Good morning. I want you to know how much I appreciate the leadership here at Jesus Community Church. God has not called us to operate independent of one another. He's called us to operate dependently, <laughs> interdependently on one another. That your strengths would help my lack and my strengths would help your lack. And uh, Dennis called me earlier this week and me and my, my uh, obliviosity <clears throat> looking at things that are just right in front of my face. Um, I, I completely overlooked something, and I want to extend my appreciation to Dennis for bringing it to mind. And I'm going to ask him to come up and share with you some of what he shared with me. And then um, Steve is going to come up and, and follow up after Dennis. Uh, so, um, um, Dennis, where'd you go? Oh, Dennis, go ahead and come on up. <clears throat> Let me move my stuff out of the way here. <clears throat> I'm going to quit calling the week. I get in trouble. Here I am. <laughs> so anyway, I haven't had time to really think about how to introduce this, but uh, I was reading the Bible and doing some studying this week, and I realized that we were about to begin this the final fall piece of the Lord that He gave to the Israelites, and. So I checked the calendar, and lo and behold, they are upon us. So I just wanted to share with you a little bit about what God said about such things uh, in the scriptures. We've all heard many times, and uh, we try to remember to keep them in context and in order and time and events. And uh, so, what I want to do is share with you a few scriptures this morning, and it has to do with the, the catching up or the rapture of the church. Uh, I like catching up because you can interpret the language in the Bible back to that terminology because people say, well, the, the rapture is never mentioned in the Bible. Well, it is, but it's through language and changing of words from one language to another, we end up with rapture. But anyway, in Matthew 25, God, Jesus gives us these words. It says, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now the bridegroom, as we know, is Christ. We are his bride. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in a jar along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and we are still waiting. And they uh, all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here is the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell the oil and buy some for yourselves. And while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went with them to, to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. So there's a picture of, I believe, people not prepared for Jesus' coming when he comes in the clouds to collect his church. And uh, you know, there are some people who teach that that's an, experiment. that's an expression of that. So that's what's going to happen at some point in time, according to this Bible. Then in 1 Thessalonians, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Uh, after that, 
we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. So there's the heart of what the rapture is going to look like. Jesus is going to come in the clouds, and which to me means somewhere in the heavens above us, and he's going to call to his people home to be with him. So then in Matthew it says, no one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the sun. So God is the, knows only when he's going to send Jesus back to pick up his bride. So we should be aware and ready at all times. <coughs> However, in the first Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the days of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So he's given us his instructions and his words in his Bible, or, or through the Bible, so that we cannot, we should know closely to when he is going to return. And there's many scriptures that refer to that. But one of the signs, one of the signs of that is uh, in Ezekiel chapter 38, there's going to be a great battle and the nations around Israel are going to come together and attack her and she is going to not be able to defend herself. Uh, and and people, believers in Israel know that they are not going to be able to defend themselves. So God is going to intervene and, and, and win the battle for her. And, and that army that is referred to uh, some of the countries as Egypt, it's going to be Russia, uh, Iran, Libya, and Ethiopia, and I think maybe a couple more countries, they're going to come together and attack her. Well, surprisingly enough, uh, there, those three armies are poised at the border of Israel today. Russia is patrolling the border, keeping the rebels fighting in Syria from flooding and escaping into Israel. Uh, Iran is sending missiles and armament into Israel for, uh, what do they say, for their own defense. Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing that's going on. Israel and Russia are cooperating with each other to destroy Iran, because they neither one of those countries like Iran, the Iran leadership. <coughs> so Russia's given permission to Israel to fly in and blow up shipments of missiles and parcels and all that stuff for war. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting bedfellows, I guess. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, I guess how that goes. But I don't know if you saw the news Yesterday it was, the leader of Turkey, of Russia, and Iran met together in the same building to discuss uh, what they're going to do with the Syrians. However, I think that's just a prelude to them getting together and saying, we want, us, we want the spoils that Israel has, their oil and their gas. <coughs> uh, our, our economies are tanking. So therefore, we need to we need to have those things. So I think that the build up for that battle is very soon, and it's very close. But so back down to Jesus's first or coming. Uh, it is my belief that the feast of trumpets is going to be the day that, that Jesus comes and receives his bride, and as of half an hour ago, the Feast of Trumpets began. So, the time is upon us. Uh, as it says in Matthew, 
that about midnight the bridegroom came. So we have a few hours left. <laughs> uh, you know, no, it says no one knows the time, day or hour, but we do need to be aware. And so my caution, I don't know if it's caution or excitement or news. I don't know what it is. Anyway, we may be out of here in a few hours. <laughs> and if it's not this year, it'll be next year. So thank you, and that's all I have to say. Good news. Thank you, Glenn. Absolutely. <coughs> Trumpets. Um, a lot of trumpets being blown during the Feast of Trumpets. And if you were here back in February, maybe, I think it was, sometime when, when Glenn was teaching on the feast, I believe it was back then that we went over this. And so we just wanted to reiterate uh, the exact blasts of the, the, the shofar. And so I'm just going to be kind of going over that again. And, I'm going to have Nathan uh, demonstrate the different shofar blasts as I, as I work through this. It won't take very long. So there are four types of uh, shofar blasts that are associated with the feasts of trumpets. And um, you know, do your research, uh, and you're going to find a whole bunch of different ideas for what. And that's not really the critical thing. Um, it's interesting to look and see what the different, different ideas are, what each one means and everything. Um, I've chosen my own sources that I've, I've looked up, and this is kind of what I've come up with. Um, I think the significant thing is that um, this, this is a feast of, that God has declared for his people Israel. Um, and I'm going to sort of bring in some of, uh, as believers, what we can kind of take out of that, I guess. Um, so the first blast I'd like to talk about is called uh, Takiya. Uh, Takiya is known as a long blast, and for example, it would be used as a king's coronation. Um, that's what they would, would do. Uh, now, we as believers in Jesus, we can recognize that he is king over our lives, and that in the future we believe he will be Israel's king, and that there will be a literal thousand-year reign of Christ as detailed in the book of Revelation and other scriptures, and he will rule from David's throne in Jerusalem. And after the thousand years are up, we believe that he will go on to reign forever and forever. Um, also recorded in the scriptures of Revelation. So Nathan, if you want to sound the Kia right now, one long blast. <laughs> So the second blast we're going to look at is called shemarim. And this word means broken or to break. And this blast is consisting of three broken notes. It reminds us of one's sins over the past year. And to the Jewish person, the Feast of Trumpets is a yearly event. And it's tied together with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The feast said, "Cleaning sacrifices are required each year by the law, and that's what what they believe. Um, and they would be, if they had a temple, they would be sacrificing um, animals and carrying out these feasts. Um, they're very limited in what they can do because they have no temple at this point. Um, the Book of Hebrews in chapter 10." says that the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. So we as believers in Jesus know that his one-time sacrifice on the cross paid the penalty once for all. And he is now seated at the right hand of the majesty, ever interceding for us, ever providing forgiveness and atonement for us. But the Jewish people, on the other hand, they're reminded yearly of their sins, 
And we are believers, as believers, we are reminded that we have a better sacrifice in Jesus. And how much more should we remember? You know, the Yom Kippur and uh, uh, trumpets are very solemn feasts for the people of Israel, for the Jewish people. And how much more we should remember um, the high costs that Jesus paid. He gave his life for us. You know, they, they depend on animal sacrifices to cover their sins for a year. Um, it cost the creator of the universe. It cost his life to provide us with eternal forgiveness. So we need to be, we should be reminded of our sins and the sorrow that they bring should bring to us and that they do bring to God. But also that he has broken the rule of sin over our lives and we can live victorious. <coughs> Nathan, if you would sound the chivalry. Okay, the third blast is known as Teruah. And these are nine staccato blasts that are considered a spiritual wake-up and should be accompanied by deep sorrow of our sinful behavior and true repentance. And when we truly come to know Jesus, we would think that we would have a deep sorrow for our sins and realize that we have sinned before a holy God and that we would have a true, genuine repentance, a turning from that sin, turning to Jesus and following in his steps. Nathan, if you would sound the Teruah. Now the fourth and final blast is known as Takiya Hagadol. And it's very similar to the Takiya, a long blast, except it's a very long blast and it should be much grander. The idea is to hold out the Takiya Hagadol as long as one possibly can until you run out of breath. Choose to do that. If you don't, we understand. <laughs> so, Hagadol means great. And it is with this blast that we have our hope and our joy of redemption and victory. As believers, we look forward to hearing the trumpet blast that's spoken by Paul the Apostle in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. With the sound of the trumpet, we who belong to Christ Jesus will realize the fulfillment of the hope we have in Him, the joy of meeting our Savior face to face when we who are the redeemed will have the final victory over sin and death. Nathan, if you would sound the Tekiah Haggadol. blessing over the shofar and then after I'm done go ahead and I'll, I'll say it in uh, Hebrew and then I'll say it in English and then when I'm done go ahead and proceed so Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kidshanu Uvedom Yeshua HaMashiach Bitzivanu Lishmoa Kol Shofar Blessed are you the Lord our God King of the Universe who sanctified us by the blood of Yeshua the Messiah and commanded us to hear the call of the shofar. on the feasts um, that God had given to Israel. We looked at the spring feast and how they were prophetically feel, filled in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, his death, 
his resurrection and the birth of the church. Um, my personal belief is that the spring feast and the fall feasts together form a chiasm. You know, okay, okay what's that? Is that like psoriasis or what is that? <laughs> no, it's, it's based off of the Greek letter chi, which is the X, okay? And positionally, you have point A, point B, point C, point D, and then you would reverse your course and go back to point C, point B, and end on point A. <clears throat> I believe that Jesus fulfilled the spring feasts, uh, the, the feast of Passover, the feast of uh, first fruits, the feast of unleavened bread, and Pentecost, or Shavuot. Um, and now <clears throat> we are in the summer festival, the summer season, the harvest, the growing, everything's going on. We've received the, the spring feast, or the spring harvest, and then we get to the fall. Now the last feast in the spring was uh, Shavuot, or what, what in the Greek is known as Pentecost. Um, Pentecost was filled with the birth of the church, with the giving of God's spirit down to the earth. Um, and so the church was born as a direct result of Pentecost, and Pentecost being 50 days. It was 50 days after the feast, and, and they were to celebrate again. And, and that, then summer happens, and we're in the summer, which we call the church age, the dispensation of grace. Okay? And that's where God's grace has been extended to all of the people of the earth, his word says that God desires that all men would be saved. Okay, that all of mankind would be saved. We know that's his heart. So when you're praying for the salvation of a, of a loved one, you're praying God's will because his will, his desire, is that everyone would come to know him. Okay, so we're in this dispensation of grace. Well, then we come to the fall feast. Now the problem is we don't exactly know when the fall feasts are going to start, except we do know the things to look for, as, as Dennis shared with us. Uh, if you're curious about some of those things, I would encourage you to look through Matthew 24 and 25. <clears throat> I would encourage you to read the book of Revelation. Uh, there are a number of other things that we can look at. Dennis talked about Ezekiel. Uh, Zechariah is another uh, prophet, prophetic book uh, that speaks a lot about the end times. But the, the point of all of this, why, what's significant about today, is that um, when Jesus comes again, it says he's going to come with a shout of command with the voice of the archangel, and with a loud trumpet blast. As a matter of fact, in another passage, it says the last trumpet blast. And you'll see that a couple times throughout Scripture. It talks about the last trumpet blast. What we are waiting for, if you belong to Christ, what should be your earnest expectation, your earnest desire, is to hear that trumpet sound. Because when that trumpet sound comes, we're out of here. And we will receive the prize for which we are laboring right now, that which Christ has promised us. Okay, We know we have salvation by, by faith. It, it, it is by grace through faith that we receive it, but we also know that there's works that, that God has a, a, a portion for us to do. Okay, But when that trumpet blast goes, God is going to take his church out of this world. Okay, And then we're going to see some horrific times, so actually I don't know that we'll even see them, I don't know that we'll care being where we are, but the earth will see some horrific times, uh, terrible things are going to come on the earth, God will pour out his wrath on the earth and pay back for all of the injustice, he will pay back with justice, uh, it's going to be a terrible time. But we're waiting for that trumpet blast, when that trumpet blast sounds, that's the start, the mark of the fall feasts, and we'll see the reverse of the course, as, as God started with the Jews and he moved down to the Gentiles and the birth of the church, he's going to move back away from the Gentiles and back to the Jews, and ultimately everything will be resolved. Um, we have uh, the, the fall feasts, um, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Jeannie, help me. Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths. And, and we believe that the Feast of Booths is, is filled literally in Revelation when God makes his dwelling place with man. Okay, so we're seeing these things come back. The last trumpet blast, you heard that last one that he did where he gave it everything he had. I don't know if you could see, I was watching his feet. The longer he blew, the further back on his heels he got, he got to the point where his toes were coming up <laughs> off the ground. He was giving it everything he had. Okay, and I think that's a, a beautiful illustration of what we should be doing. Yeah. 
giving it everything we have. So when we hear that last trumpet, that, that's not the last trumpet forever. No more trumpets. Okay, the last one's done. All the trumpets in the trash. That, I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think what's going to happen is it's that last call from the sequence. Now, and when the Feast of Trumpets, if you get the opportunity today, if you have access to the internet, go out and look. There will probably be stuff posted today about the Feast of Trumpets in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, with the start of the Feast of Trumpets, remember their day starts at 6 o'clock in the evening and goes through the evening, the night, the next day, and ends at 6 o'clock the next evening. Okay, when 6 o'clock comes, all of these shofars go off in Jerusalem. It's awesome to hear because you, you know, you, the ones that I've watched, there's somebody very close uh, that's blowing, and then you can hear in the distance all of these shofars blowing. Okay? Now, there, there's a ritual to this. Steve uh, shared with us what each of the blasts are called. They are done in sequence 99 times, with the exception of uh, the Tekiah Hagadol, which is only done once. And that rounds it out to a perfect hundred blasts. And that last blast is done as long as they can possibly hold it out with everything that they've got in them. That's the last trumpet that I think we're going to be listening for. It's going to be that last blast that is, man, you're sold into this thing. You're fully committed. You can't do... Has anybody tried to blow this thing? It makes some really rude and offensive sounds if you don't know how to do it right. Okay? You've really got to have control. You've got to have good diaphragm control. You've got to have good embouchure in your mouth to be able to make this thing work, which is why we have Nathan do it. Okay? And so um, you have to be, you have to have support and you have to have control. And so what we are looking for at the Feast of Trumpets, Christ's return. I mean, this is what our great hope is. This is the fulfillment of everything that he promised us. He's going to come. He's going to take us out. He is going to have his way with the earth. There will be a literal thousand year reign with Jesus ruling in the capital of Jerusalem. And then at the end of the thousand years, I don't know why God does this. He did, you know, when God set all this in motion, he didn't talk to me. <laughs> he didn't ask my opinion. He didn't fill me in on what he was thinking. But he did tell me what was going to happen. And that's in his word. Okay, Just like he told you. But at the end of the thousand years, Satan is going to be let loose on the earth. He's going to gather the nations again. And, you know, a thousand years, I guess, is not long enough uh, to remember something because they're all going to come again. And Jesus is going to do the same thing that he did the first time. And he's going to wipe them all out. And then everything will be done. Okay? And we will enter into glory for eternity. God will make his dwelling place with man. Now think about that for a moment. In the garden, at creation... God, I'm going to put this down. God did not dwell with man. He came and he visited. We know that he came and walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening, but he didn't make his dwelling place there. When God established Israel as a nation, and he claimed them for his own, he had them build the ark, and uh, the, the, the very presence of God would exist, would sit above the mercy seat. Okay. But the problem is, only one person, one time a year, could come into his presence. Okay. Well, the veil has been rent. Okay. The Spirit of God is no longer behind the veil. But God still does not exist with man. He's still in heaven. His Spirit is here, accomplishing his purposes. But the presence of God is in heaven. When God sets everything right, he will make his dwelling place with man. He will be manifestly present before us, in the midst of us. You talk about streets of gold. You talk about gates made of giant pearls. You talk about the foundations made of every precious stone. I don't think any of that's going to matter. Even that is not sufficient. You look at the things that Solomon did when he built the temple, the ivory, the precious wood, the precious stones, the gold. In the, the most holy place, everything was covered in gold. And that was insufficient for the glory of God. So when, when the new Jerusalem comes and it's got all of these beautiful things, I don't think we're really going to be paying that much attention. Because the manifest presence of God is going to be there and it's going to so far overshadow everything else, it's going to be almost inconsequential. 
okay? But man, I'm looking forward to that trumpet blast. When Dennis told me uh, earlier this week, he said, hey, you know what's going on Sunday? And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still worried about Friday. <laughs> we had a whole family get together for Christy's birthday, and we had to, to take nine children around Nevada City. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, <coughs> I don't have the energy. I said, Dennis, I, I, I can't get past Friday. And he said, you know, we're out of here on Sunday. And as soon as he said, we're out of here, I know exactly what he's talking about. <laughs> it's the Feast of Trumpets. Rosh Hashanah. We're done. Well, let's go. Okay. We don't know if it's this one. I would be, oh, God, I would be thrilled if it were this day. I would be ecstatic. We know the seasons. We don't know the hour. And I think that should be a caution to us to be prepared. Be ready. Be like that servant that was busy about his master's work when his master came home. Don't be the servant that was sitting in the master's chair with his feet up on the desk when the master returned. Okay? God has given us work to do, work created for us from way back when, stuff to be about. He's given us the great commission that we are to be, to be preaching the gospel. We're to be witnesses to this world. We're to be his ambassadors. We've got to be busy about the things that he gave us. Now, there's a lot of stuff in this life that we've got to deal with. We have to have jobs. We have to do, th we have to do things that we don't like. The lawn needs to be mowed. The bills need to be paid. But those things should be secondary to the primary reason that uh, the things of what we should be about. Okay? So, Feast of Trumpets today, like Dennis said, um, there was a time that the, the um, bridegroom was coming. There was enough time that they said, hey, we've got we to prep our, our lamps. We've got to get them ready. And the others were like, oh, we don't have any oil. Go to town and get your own oil. Get your oil in your lap. Make sure you're ready so that when he comes back, you can go in. Because the end of that story is when the five came back, the door was locked. And they pounded on the door and they said, we're here, we're here. And they said, it's too late. Door's locked. The bridegroom has passed. The moment is gone. Okay? So be ready. When that announcement comes that the bridegroom is coming, make sure you got oil in your lamp. Be ready. Okay? And I'll tell you what, man. If, if I have enough warning, I'm jumping. I want him to catch me on the way up. Okay? So, all right. So, Feast of Trumpets. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do if Nathan ever leaves. Somebody needs to start taking shofar lessons. Okay? All right. So, we are going to be starting a new series. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction today. If you have your Bible, open to Genesis. Chapter 1. Yeah, we're doing the whole book. What was that? I heard, I heard almost a groan. Okay. The series that we're going to be working through... I'm just going to call it a, a family affair. Okay? Does anybody remember the show, A Family Affair? Mm -hmm. You know, um, Mr. French was the man. Okay, I love Mr. French. Um, what I want to talk to us about over the course of these next weeks is how God designed and intended the family to work. Okay? We in America have very little understanding of what God implemented and how he wants it to work. Um, part of that is because of our culture. Um, one of the most amazing things that I can see all throughout history is that as a particular culture grew and flourished, um, as a mark of their progress, they became more and more inclusive of sin. And things that uh, generations before they wouldn't even consider uh, are, are embraced and, and actually encouraged. And it's a, a kind of a, a scary thing. Um, we know that civilizations have birth, they have you know, their infancy, they have their young adulthood, their adulthood, and, and then their, their dotage and their demise. Um, but one of the things that's absolutely amazing to me 
is that uh, it seems like without fail, as a civilization comes into their adulthood and as they mature, they begin to embrace things that they formerly would, would be vehemently opposed to, okay? So what we're gonna talk about over the course of the, the next few weeks, we're gonna talk about the family as God gave it, what the roles are and what those roles include, okay? What scripture tells us should be the position of each of the person in the family as it relates first between them and God and then them and the other members of the family, okay? So, you guys get strapped in and ready to go because we're gonna go on a trip. Now, I wanna confess to you right now, um, God actually gave me the seeds of this about four years ago. And I've been working over the course of four years, pulling notes together, putting things together, and um, I don't wanna do this lesson. I don't wanna do this series because I think a lot of people are gonna have their toes stepped on. I know I had my toes stepped on when I was looking at being a man in a family as a husband and as a father, okay? Uh, I got a lot of burned fingers there. I got a little too close to the flames and went, ouch, okay? So I'm asking that as I teach this, you would deal with me in grace as I will deal with you in grace and that you will let God's word be the final arbiter of how these things operate, okay? All right, so why are we in Genesis? <clears throat> because that's where God first implemented the family for us, okay? Adam and Eve were not the first family. They were the first human family. We know that the first family is the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And, and God put a model for us as to how that is supposed to look and how that's supposed to operate uh, by giving us family. So we're going to look in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. I'm just going to read a couple passages. I'm going to highlight a couple things, and, and we're going to leave it there for this week. And then we'll get into it a little more, a little bit more depth in the coming weeks. Um, so, verse 26, chapter 1. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every bird, uh, beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And then 31, this is, this is really cruel. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Um, I, I actually extended that passage down a little bit further outside the bounds of family because one of the things that we don't really comprehend and understand, um, when sin came in, it completely corrupted everything. It changed the nature of creation. Okay, did, did you see in verse 29 it said, Behold, I give you, oh, I'm sorry, verse 30, it says, And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. Now think about the implications of that for a moment. What would a lion look like if it were a plant eater, if it were an herbivore? Those massive fangs, and those sharp teeth, would not benefit it in chewing grass and fruit. <clears throat> you see these majestic eagles that are flying. How would they have had to change to go from eating seeds and plants and fruit 
to eating meat. See, when, when sin came in, the very nature of creation changed. Okay? And, and we are so used to the nature of it with our sin. I love steak. I could sit down and eat a steak and have no vegetables and be completely happy. If I sat down to eat vegetables and didn't have a steak, I wouldn't be as happy. Okay? No, Pastor Glenn is not opposed to vegetables. I love salad. That's not a problem. I just like steak more. Okay? So, I, something that I want you to grasp is that what we see in the world today, what we accept as normal, is not the way God intended it. Okay? But that very last part, the one thing that I, I really like about this, as you go through Genesis 1, each time God created something, he got to the end of the day, and he would look at it, and he would say, it was good. Okay, then he got to the end of creation, the end of day 6, and he looked at it, and he saw it was very good. Very good. God was satisfied. Okay. So, <clears throat> let's back up, and we're going to look at the family real quick here. Okay, so that it's day six. All the, the living creatures on the land, uh, the beasts of the earth and those creeping things, those are made. And then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, just I would just want to pause here for a moment. Man there, the, the Hebrew word is Adam, Adam, okay? We, we look at it and we translate it as man, but it's better translated as mankind. Okay? It includes women. Men and women. God didn't just create man in his image and then uh, go back to the drawing board for woman. He created them in his image. That's clarified a little bit further down in 27. So God created man in his own image. Again, the word is Adam. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay? So God created both men and women in his image. Now, they were created for different purposes. Okay? God created us for different purposes. Now, if you look um, further up, when God's talking about making man, he says, and let them have dominion over all the stuff on the earth. Okay? And then God made him and blessed them and told them they're tasking. You will have dominion over all the earth. And then he said, um, 28, he said, be fruitful and multiply. <coughs> Kudos to Benji and Shane. <laughs> okay. So God created them to have dominion. He gave them a job. He gave them a tasking with that job to be fruitful and to multiply. But then he, he kind of breaks things down a little bit differently. And we'll see this in chapter 2, and I'm not going to get here today. Uh, we're going to call it because I've got something else that I really want to talk to you guys about for a few minutes. Um, I would encourage you, get into chapter 2 this week. Read chapter 2 and look at the interplay of how God creates and how God directs and how God implements what he desires of both Adam, Adam, and Eve, okay? Because we're going to talk about the, the roles that God created us to fill. 